Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, Michael, Bax, wherever you are, thanks for uh, having us here. Uh, love traveling around and uh, speaking to groups, uh, especially those outside of Silicon Valley, where maybe some of this stuff is new. So this morning, I thought we had a couple of great examples of practical applications of lean startup methodologies um, and how you can grow successful businesses, as well as how you can use these principles to test and validate and even kick out uh, bad ideas. Patrick and I actually kind of want to take a little bit of a step back and talk about some of the things that, that we see going on uh, in the startup world generally and why now is the right time uh, for lean startups. Um, also, you know, we'd love to make this interactive, so if you guys have questions or you want to challenge what we're saying, speak up. Yeah, in fact, if you don't speak up, I'm going to actually pick on you. There's an there's <laughs> English guy here with a beard who seemed pretty vocal. Uh, that guy, I'm going to find you and I'm going to make you ask more questions. <laughs> um, also, you know, we're talking about a lot of things that Ash, Rishi, and uh, Rob brought up. Uh, I think for the most part, there's a 98% overlap, but there will be times when, when you see Brett and I implicitly disagree, and that's okay. Uh, reasonable people can certainly disagree. Uh, I'd love for you guys to challenge us on this and ask us why we think some of these things and, and really make this about you, not us. All right? <coughs> so real quick, uh, I've been uh, playing around with uh, various startups in various roles for 14, 15 years. Uh, wrote a book on customer development. I blog at Market by Numbers. I also am a customer development consulting, so for for the longest time, I was doing sort of traditional marketing consulting, um, though really on the analytical side, not what I call fluffy marketing, which is about brand and, and uh, buying Super Bowl ads. Uh, so I was really drawn to the analytical side, ROI, uh, marketing metrics. Um, I've got a couple side projects as well that I'm custodying now and, uh, and, and blogging about this stuff too. So that's sort of my background. So I've uh, effectively founded and killed uh, Flame.2 bootstrap startups. And a lot of actually what Rob brought up with Iron Glass uh, really resonated with me. Uh, the, uh, this, these two projects really were so embarrassingly painful in retrospect about what we know now about how startups uh, perhaps should function and things they should do right, how to get everything wrong. So uh, I'm working on a third. That's why there's a big question mark there. Uh, but I'd also advise you, I don't have a big, I've never seen a big exit. Uh, I haven't been to the Nirvana product market fit, so whatever I say, take with a grain of salt, maybe a truckload of salt. Uh, whatever Brent says is actually pure gold, so no mistakes there. Um, I'm also, as you know, I, I am also the co-author with Brent of the Entrepreneur's Guide to Customer Development, where we took Steve's book and we, uh, we sort of made a cheat sheet to the, the Cliff Notes version of it. I'm also a mentor at 500 Startups, and then I run a tech conference in LA called Twist Up. So let's talk a little bit about the changing environment. So the first thing is, is that uh, this new startup reality is a global phenomenon. So if you look at who's tweeting about lean startups and startups in general, entrepreneurship, you'll see this is happening around, around the world. If you look at uh, where lean startup meetups are going on, it's around the world, 100,000 members, 80 cities. Uh, uh, in October, uh, Patrick and I are going to travel to, to Portugal to talk about lean startups. Looks like I'm going to Malaysia. Um, so it's really, it's really incredible uh, that there are these uh, entrepreneurs around the world and they're building tech startups. So the other thing that uh, Patrick and I participate in is Lean Startup Weekends, which is, has everybody heard of Startup Weekend? Sort of a hackathon, get engineers together, build products over the weekend. So there's a lean startup version of that. Uh, and and uh, Patrick and I both participate in that, Boston, New York, San Francisco, and again, what amazes me is you go to these different places, and the same thing with Startup Weekend, it's global, is the number of high quality ideas. There is a renaissance of entrepreneurship, and it's global. The, uh, the, oops, Brent and dueling here with the, with the clicker. You know, more than ever, startup, the reality is that it's becoming more inexpensive. Right, so it's been said that the 500,000 is the new 5 million, right? Because remember back in the dot-com boom and bust, you had people go out just on the strength of an idea, raise $5 million, 
you know, work, you know, nine months at it and deliver sort of a, a you know, a beta or a prototype. People are doing that in, in weeks uh, with a lot less money, right? Part of that is driven, and in fact, a lot of that is driven on, you know, the how mature free and open source software has become. Uh, the technology stacks have been commodified. You're seeing APIs, you're seeing mashups. It's it's getting faster and cheaper than ever to do a startup. Uh, the reason there's asterisks there on inexpensive, because there are obviously some caveats, right? If you're doing clean tech, if you're doing uh, medical devices, those are different markets. Those require different capital structures. But in general, the web startup space is getting a lot, lot cheaper. And then this is sort of a, there's an endogenous loop going on between startups are getting cheaper and the emergence of, you know, super angels and their investing patterns, which we'll cover later in the presentation. So startups are social. And I don't mean just from a, like a social marketing perspective. The fact that you actually have conferences like this one where you get to meet fellow startup founders and you discuss methodologies for building startups, that's actually pretty darn new. You've got meetups uh, in, in your own uh, local cities where these startup founders are getting together and exchanging ideas. You've got forums online where you can discuss this stuff. Um, so it's a pretty amazing new reality that you can actually collaborate not only with your fellow founders, but also with people that have done it in the past. So you're getting ideas, you're getting mentorship. This isn't the way it was 10 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, sort of back in the day, back in the 90s, you know, meetups were about, I'm going to talk about me and I'm going to give you my business card and I'm going to follow up and I'm going to try to sell you my services. What I find today is completely the opposite. Now I go to meetups and it's not about you buying from me, it's about what sort of value can I provide you. And I actually give away my stuff. I hold a meetup every week, almost by office hours now, and I'll tell anybody about you know, my customer development practices or what I think about their business model, give it away for free. Because, I don't know, karma, startup karma, right? So to me that's the new reality and it's a great time to be building startups because of that. You're going to get expert mentorship. You're going to get uh, to vet your ideas among uh, among your your uh, your uh, same people that are at the, the same stage that you're at. And guess what? If you're successful, or when you fail and you've learned uh, startup lessons, you're going to turn around and you're going to give that to the new startups. So again, this is creating a new this is a new phenomenon. Another thing that's, that Ash talked about quite uh, eloquently is, is metrics and, and, and how metrics are driving a lot of decision making in startups. Uh, a lot of these tools have been around in some shape or another for, for you know, 10, 15 years. Split testing has been around forever. It's just been recently that people have actually adopted these because, again, you know, technology is becoming commoditized and these, these solutions, which uh, at one time were very expensive, are becoming you know, almost there are instances of free, right? So Google Web Optimizer comes to mind as a free version of split testing. This allows for uh, better decision making, we hope, and, and uh, decision making based, based on better data. This is also, again, a, a very new reality. It used to be back in 2000, right? Just let's, let's get on, you know, uh, whatever the precursor to TechCrunch was, and let's just get eyeballs on our site, right? Didn't, didn't tell you what kind of segment was coming. A lot of people didn't track conversion. In fact, most people didn't track conversion. And didn't really tell you anything about your visitors or any meaningful data. Right? All about vanity metrics. Right, exactly. As so Eric Reese talks about vanity metrics. Like, oh, I got a million uniques on my site yesterday. Okay, anyone buy anything? Right. And uh, this is changing, right? Google Analytics, you know, when they purchased Urchin and then they uh, basically made Google Analytics free, you're seeing uh, Kiss Metrics for, for funnel optimization, uh, changing the way startups are being built. And, and uh, I've personally seen people literally transition from sort of the old way of kind of gut feel and et cetera, et cetera, to actually start really getting into Google Analytics. Uh, and as Ash says, at the right time, right? The difference between optimization and, 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 and how you do go about the learning. This is actually, I, I don't know of any successful startup that does not have a metrics driven approach. It doesn't mean that you do whatever the data says, because as we all know, uh, reasonable people can interpret the exact same data differently. But it's it's much much more grounded in reality, which is a which we didn't see a lot of back in you know the 2000 uh, era. It's all, it's also not just about marketing, right? It's about uh, you know there's usertesting.com, there's you know there's the unbounce, there's the landing page stuff, there's you know uh, get satisfaction or these ways to, to uh, measure user mood. There's Kiss Insights, you know, where you can ask a one pop up survey. So not only are there a ton of tools that you can use to actually get real data 
about your customers. But it's also the instrumentation, right? You're, you're instrumenting your product so you know what features people are using. So you're no longer guessing, right? So that, that again, it's fundamentally different, right? If people, people were building uh, software products that ran on the desktop, yeah, no wonder it all became bloatware, right? It's because you didn't know what your users were using. They ask for features, you give it to them. But now you actually can kill a feature that nobody's using. You can keep your web apps or, or your, your SaaS applications to be, to be centered right around what the, what the tip of the spear is, right? What, what is that one functionality that is, is the killer part of your application? You can actually measure that stuff. So, sort of the result of all of these things, the socialness, the inexpensiveness, the, the, uh, the data, is that today's founders are more savvy than ever. You are more savvy than your counterparts 5, 10, 15 years ago. doesn't mean you're more intelligent. What it means is that you have more knowledge. This is, this is not just like a feel-good thing. This is, this is fundamentally changing the way startups are built because you've already, you've already uh, encapsulated, you've already had this knowledge base that it took entrepreneurs five, ten years to do in the past. The, the, one of the reasons, right, the super angels are becoming so popular because on the, you know, aside from their entrepreneur friendly terms and smaller rounds and, and less dilution, is a lot of those guys have been through this fight one time, right? They know the mistakes, they've been bloody, they have the black eyes, and operationally they've had the experience, right? The first time around, a lot of the VCs and investors have never run actually a web startup before, right? And, and had not been in the trenches. Things are radically different. There's a reason why, you know, you may want to go get, talk to Dave McClure and get him to give you money because he has deep insight into what it means to build a web startup. So, the new world order. You've got hundreds of thousands of masons, uh, actually entrepreneurs, uh, that, are, that are global. Uh, many of them are using lean startup or lean startup type of principles in order to test their business models before they go and get money. This has fundamentally changed the power equation. It is now not with the, the investors like it was uh, last decade. It's now with you. You guys have the power in, in, in the relationship between uh, investors and, and startup people. Uh, you're hearing a lot of complaints from the investors that for example, startups aren't going for the big win, and there's a good reason for that, because now that you have the power, guess what? $10 million, $25 million, $50 million win is big enough for you, and it should be. It's life-changing. And what it means is that you're actually going to become the investor if you, if you succeed in that way. So though the big win is still a great goal, that's what's going to continue to change society, that's what's going to have you know, big disruptions. I think that's a great goal, but it's no longer is that going to be the dominant investment paradigm. And my belief is that what we're actually creating is uh, an innovation machine. So as more and more services are outsourced in the same way we went from agricultural to industry and industry to services, uh, we're leaving services and what we're going to have is an innovation machine. It's a, it's entrepreneurship becomes our comparative advantage. So <clears throat> the story to illustrate this is uh, I was talking to a pretty prominent VC. It was a buddy of mine and, and we were discussing pretty much what Brian just said. And I asked him, you know, what's your value at? Why do people, why should entrepreneurs come for you to give you money? For you to give them money. What's your value at? The smart investors have always had a massive value add. The middling ones are now just going to go, okay, I think we need a value add. The, the, the stupid money is just money, right? That's no, longer, that's no longer the case. You have to have a value add. And when folks are raising money, they, they're more and more making a pitch on not just themselves, but saying, hey, I want your money. Here's why I want your money. And this is actually horribly disruptive to the to kind of the old guard that is not changing with the times. And, and we're seeing massive massive flux and you've heard about you know angel gate uh, super angels micro vcs all this stuff and and brand i think that we're in the middle of this massive disruptive phase right now we're not we're not nowhere near the, the end of it right and no one's no one exactly knows how it's going to play play out obviously
but it's causing pain for folks that like being in the power position, just kind of handing out the checks to whomever they deem worthy. We're now uh, more and more the, the the shift is towards entrepreneur. And so, I actually asked this, back to my my VC friend. He says he loses deals, not to other VCs. He loses them to entrepreneurs who successfully bootstrap their way into big companies. That's who he's losing deals to. He's very aware of this. He's actually kind of struggling with what his value add is. And more and more people are asking him that. Maybe not in explicit terms, but he's losing deals, good deals, because uh, some B2B startups, some SaaS startups, can get customer financing. And why do you see and get diluted, right? And he's, he's quite frankly struggling with this. So it's a big deal. So let's get to three big ideas that lean startups are really about. So, one of the key things that Steve Blank talks about in, in The Four Steps of Epiphany, a book you all should buy and read today, if not tomorrow. Right now. Right? <laughs> you can build the product that you're dreaming of building. Again, unless you're in sort of life sciences or some clean tech, or you're working on some really difficult algorithm for data warehousing, perhaps, most startups are not, don't fail because they couldn't build the product. They fail because they didn't have a market. They built a product that nobody wanted. So that's big idea number one. So let me also add, this idea is deceptively simple, right? I, I present this to my friends who aren't in tech, and they're like, oh, obviously. And it, it wasn't obvious to me when I read Steve's book, and that's why actually Steve's book had such a, a mass effect, because I'd read sort of the, uh, the, uh, the literature of startups, kind of the raw, raw stuff, like, oh, Persevere and you can do it and just keep pounding the pavement and that was sort of the strategy, right? And if you actually look at it, it's not a strategy in any way, shape, or form. Steve identified large meta patterns that are applicable to not all, but I'd say most tech startups. And don't be fooled by the simplicity of this idea. Oh. So, big idea number two. You're not really trying to figure out how much time before you can get your idea out to the market, right? You've got limited time, you've got limited money, oh, I've got six months, I've got, to get my, I've got to build my product and launch within that six months. But actually, all the startups, virtually all the startups we know and love, started as a different company than what they ended up being, right? YouTube, dating site. Intel started as DRAM. Uh, PayPal, microprocessing for the Palm Pilot. So, big idea number two, your business model is going to change. So if you buy that, then what you have to do in six months, what you have to do before you run out of money, is find the working business model. So what you need to do is iterate, buzzword alert, or pivot, bigger buzzword alert, until you find that what works. So you have, it's the number of cycles, the number of pivots you can run through before you run out of money. And this is in, uh, in the three circles that, uh, that Ash drew. This is, the, this is the speed stuff, right? You've got to do it as quickly as possible. So, <clears throat> another book we recommend you read, again, today, now. Uh, Clayton Christian talks about uh, disruptive and sustaining innovations, and one of, the, one of his many big ideas is about the, the epistemology, to use, a very, to use a $2 word, of startups, right? And this is also one of the deceptively simple ideas about how, uh, how market applications are actually unknown. And this is actually very important. If you, if you actually buy the startups and customer development, and no one says you have to, but if you buy into the, the philosophy, you should understand this is one of the underlying assumptions around why we think it makes, why lean startup is a good methodology, or why it isn't. Um, and in that's 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 So uh, the, from this book, I mean, what I love about this book, it was written in the early 90s. So, Tech people love to think that they need to reinvent everything. So a lot of these principles in lean startups and customer development have existed in other industries for, since the beginning of time. But we're just going to reinvent it all here in tech, right? So 
what I loved about this pre-bubble book was about, he has some great disk drives example, but the example that I really liked was his Honda example. So have people read this with the example of Honda coming to the North American market? So they built a, uh, a motorcycle with a smaller engine, more efficient, and the, the, the big idea was they're going to come to the, mar uh, the United States and they can compete against BMW and Harley Davidson, so these big powerful bikes. So we've got this less expensive, uh, you know, smaller, lighter, um, this bike is going to, this motorcycle is going to, you know, just kick up. So these two guys are living in, in Los Angeles, these two, uh, uh, the North American salespeople for, the, for Honda, are living in Los Angeles and they're going around to the different dealerships, the motorcycle dealerships, and the dealerships won't even, they won't even carry the bike. They don't even actually even get to test with the end users because it, there's dealers, there's no way. This bike's not selling, we're not even going to carry it. So out of frustration, these guys started riding the bikes, the motorcycles, in the hills around Los Angeles. That was back when there was some open space. Um, there's not any open space available there anymore. Uh, so they started riding these bikes off-road. And people would come up to them and say, hey, that looks pretty cool. Where do I get one of these? So this is happening in the 50s, and it's crazy. I had no idea this was true. Off-road motorcycle didn't exist. That sport did not exist prior to these two Honda sales guys living in Los Angeles taking these bikes off-road. That was the birth of off-road motorcycle. So not only did they not envision this, but the early projections from Honda about how many of these were going to sell, they were going to sell, were very conservative. They were tame, but they were excited. Oh, we got this brand new market. We're going to sell 20,000 of these puppies. They sold 200,000 in the first year. In a disruptive technology, in a disruptive product, the market is not only unknown, it's unknowable. Right? So it kind of kills me that you've got not only the visionary entrepreneurs, right, media myth alert, on the one hand, and you've got high-powered VCs, on the other hand, who are all saying, oh, I'm only going to invest in companies that are going for the billion-dollar market, right? As if they know what companies are going to go for the billion-dollar market. They don't. How many people turn down Google? How many people turn down Twitter? How many people turn down Facebook? I mean, that's the story over and over again, is that these high-powered VCs and even what we call the visionary entrepreneurs did not know the size of the market for their disruptive technology. And in fact, just to dovetail on what Brand was saying, I'm going to steal a story that Eric Reese told a few weeks ago. So if Eric is uh, listening to this, I'm, I'm going to steal this. <laughs> so no one would accuse Mark Zuckerberg of having a, a lack of vision. No one would say he's, in, he, he's got insufficient vision. But if you actually scratch beyond the surface and go beyond sort of the, the myth-making that goes on the media that we're all sort of complicit in, uh, you actually find out that in 2004, when he had moved to Palo Alto from Cambridge, he actually was working on another project besides Facebook. It was called Wirehawk. Go If you guys Google it, you'll find the Wikipedia page. You'll find everything you need to know about it. It was going to be another version of Napster. In 2004, 2006, he was kind of working on these two projects in parallel. And the, my assumption is, is because he didn't know the potential of Facebook, right? And now when we see this massive success, you know, multi-billion dollar valuation, et cetera, et cetera, of course, he's a visionary, right? Again, I just want to underscore the story because the, as Brent says, the, the, these markets, disruptive innovation is virtually unknowable. That's why we think that the lean startup is, is a good way to sort of tackle these sorts of problems. Now, this little graph here at the top, you have the four steps of customer development. Below, you have a, uh, a visual depicting sort of agile development process. This is in a, in a kind of a quick nutshell, the lean startup. You have the customer development attacking the problem side, and you have the, uh, the, the agile development process attacking the solution side. So why, why does this make sense? Because you have to accept the fact that the problem is effectively unknown, and, and so is the solution. And this is, my analogy here is, is, is like a giant Sudoku, Puzzle, which I, actually my mother-in-law loves them, she tears right through them, I can't stand them. It's because if you fiddle with one part of the Sudoku, so let's say I fiddle with the product or the price, it changes how my solution looks, who I'm selling it to, 
right? So you have a system of simultaneous equations that are where both sides unknown. If you guys are engineers, this should hopefully resonate with you guys. Otherwise, I need to change my presentation. <laughs> okay. This is the way I fundamentally understand lean startups, and until Eric or Steve correct me, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, so, so what this is actually depicting, sort of at a high level, is that not only do you use learning iterative practices inside of uh, engineering, but you also do that in sales and marketing. And so fundamentally, customer development represents the processes for learning rather than just merely executing, right? So most of us view sales and marketing as, you know, go to your toolkit, pull out what you've done before, go to town. If you fail, you're going to be replaced by somebody else who's got a toolkit and they're going to do their thing, right? So that's the execution model. And really what the, what the customer development side of Lean Startups is, is to use these learning processes, use iterative cycles in order to figure out what's the right way to do before, before you start blowing it up, before you actually bring in the people that do know how to execute. You need to bring in the people that need to learn how to do it first. So four steps to the epiphany basically goes through, uh, these are the four steps to Steve Blank's epiphany. Uh, customer discovery, validation, company creation, company building. Most of you, if you're a startup founder, when you get here, you get kicked out of your company. But don't worry, you've already made a lot of money. And actually, if you are such an entrepreneur, you prefer to be over on the other side anyway. You prefer to be where there's chaos, as Steve says. This is where, when you start doing uh, the, the company creation, you're, you're scaling, and often that brings order and company processes and Boredom. silos and all of these things that you guys really don't want to do. Um, this was fundamentally built, uh, this came out of uh, Steve Blake's experiences in the 90s. Uh, and it was a very, as, as Ash mentioned, very B2B centric. But the, the, the philosophy itself applies to, to any business, any business with market risk. And so I, I actually lived through startups in the 90s, and so when I read this, that I'd go, yep, yeah, that happened to me, and that I'm going to explain in a second. But what's crazy is it still happens. And what it is is the old model of building, of building a company, right? So you write your 40-page business plan. Inside of that 40-page business plan, you put your requisite hockey stick revenue, right? You have to have that. No, nobody in their mind would, would fund you based on a baseball bat revenue projection or a football. It's got to be a hockey stick. It's got to have this huge swoop up, right? You got those numbers. You put them into your financials in order for it to look like a hockey stick, right? You didn't, like, do your market research. You know, this is why Gartner and the top-down method was always used, right, as Rob brought in. The top-down method is used because it's easier to draw a hockey stick in your financials. And the type of market research you did then was not, am I right? It's like, oh, I need to go prove that I'm right. So I need to go find the data that shows that my hockey stick is true. You put that in your business plan. You go to the VCs and they go, yep, there's a hockey stick. How much money do you want? <laughs> right? So then you go, OK, got my money, paid myself a nice salary. Hire my engineers. Okay, we need to build this product. Sat down for six months. Eh, no, probably a year, two years even. Build your product. As you're getting close to launch, you hire your marketing people. You got your sales people, right? So you've actually got your field sales people before the market launch because you're training them on the product. Hire your PR firm. That's a great way to spend money. Fifteen thousand dollars a month right out the door. Planning this huge launch, right? So you launch your product, you get a ton of buzz. Today it's called the TechCrunch bump, right? Tens of thousands, maybe hundred thousand people come to your website, and you're like, woo, blowing up, high fives. And a month later, it's starting to go down. Two months later, three months later, 
And not only has it gone down, guess what? Your retention, there's no retention. Nobody's saying. You've got a small level of people that maybe you reach that are using your product, right? And you've maybe just killed your product. So TechCrunch Bump can actually kill your product. You've done it, you got it out there, and maybe that was your only shot. And in the B2B world, what it was is you've got a burn rate that's you know, through the roof because you've got your field salespeople out there that are selling your product that you never really, truly tested before you built and launched it. So you miss your first, or maybe actually you, you get your first quarter revenue because you've sold it to board members, friends, CEOs, brother-in-law. No, he's using the product. At least you've sold some. <clears throat> Then you maybe go through this opportunistic cycle where you're, you're going to sell to anybody that you can, even though you can't scale a company like that, because they all want different features, different ways to reach them, different sales cycles. So then you miss your revenue numbers. And the board goes, okay, what's up, CEO? CEO goes to the sales guy, okay, what's up, VP of sales? VP of oh, marketing guy. It's just failing to execute. He's gone. Next quarter, miss your revenue. Board of directors, okay, Mr. CEO. Mr. CEO goes to BP sales. Don't give me that marketing story. You gave me that, you're out of here, right? <laughs> Third time you miss it, board of directors doesn't even talk to the CEO. He's just out, right? So we, we, we started, we chuckle at it. It's kind of funny. It actually is true. Two companies in San Diego within the last year I've seen go through that scenario. Not exactly, but the VP of marketing was gone, CEO's CMO friend comes in, CEO's gone, new guy comes in, he needs to change out his team, sort of excuses in order to get the board to like stick with you for a little bit longer. So ultimately what often happens with these businesses and again they're still being built today but boy last decade and decade before that was just the standard way of building a company is remember those that requisite hockey stick revenue that was essentially a contract with the vc and and when that fails the vc just kind of takes the company sells the technology or does whatever it is kills it brings in a whole new team so that's the old, the old way. Steve Blank said, Let, let's do this a different way. If you, you know, Crossing the Chasm, how many people read Crossing the Chasm? Another book, you have to go read it. If you have, you know, marketing Bible for the last 20 years. So Crossing the Chasm is awesome. If you can get to the chasm. So Steve Blank's Four Steps to the Epiphany is about getting to the chasm. So rather than pretending that sales and marketing is just merely an execution, why don't we use the same sort of principles, the same learning principles, be as scientific as we can. You cannot be exact scientific on the uh, sales and marketing side because you're dealing with irrational human beings. But what if we put these processes in place that get us to the castle? So this story tends to recapitulate itself over and over again. I have a friend of mine at a very well-funded startup in LA. They have brand, you know, brand name investors that if I mentioned, you know who they are. And uh, a few months ago, he calls me up and says, dude, we just closed five fucking deals this week. It's fucking awesome. High five. So next time I see you, beer's on me. Super excited, right? Awesome. A week later, he calls me up. He goes, what? totally despondent, right? Goes, we're recapitulating the four steps. None of, none of the, the deals look the same. They're different customers, different customer segments, different the dollar revenues. None of them are scalable, right? And what had happened is their sales guy had been hired and he went to execute. The guy is a silver tongued salesman, the, the epitome of the silver tongued salesman that you want selling your stuff, right? And he did what he did best. He went and sold and that's how he's incentivized, right? He's executing on sales mode. But for where they are, that's not what they need. They need someone to actually search for that, the sales and marketing roadmap. And so actually, long story short, my buddy actually left the startup because you know he drinks this Kool-Aid like I do, and, and he's doing his own thing now. But you see, this, you see this very simple little story that Brand just told, and Steve fleshed out further. You see it time and time again, and the, the, the difference being the search for the model and the execution of the model, and when you want to do that. Oops. We're 
invite him in. Yeah. All right, so, so Patrick and I like to boil this stuff down to sort of these three meta principles. And the reason why we do this is because for you to, for you to become artists, for you to be able to be the, you know, understand the art of entrepreneurship and become the entrepreneur who is the artist, you eventually need to make this stuff your own, right? It's, there is no blueprint. There is no one methodology. There are not eight steps. There are not four steps that if you go and do this, you're going to, you're going to crush it. It doesn't exist. You have to be able to apply these principles to your own business. And so, frankly, Patrick and I can walk off stage and you guys are good to go and hit the street if you get these three principles. Question and test your own assumptions. Believe in yourself. Be skeptical of your ideas. Number one. Number two, Steve Blanks, get out of the building. Get out of the building is Blanks' phrase for go and talk to your customers. But it isn't just talking to your customers. All of these other methods that, uh, that Ash and Rob talked about apply as well, right? You're instrumenting, your surveys, your usability testing, you know, using UX principles, custom, UX people have been doing customer development type stuff for ages. So all of these things are, are get out of the building. And I say that, but I also emphasize talk to your customers. So all of the tools that I mentioned earlier, you know, usertesting.com, askyourtargetmarket.com. Engineers are absolutely brilliant about developing tools that they are hoping, hoping against hope will replace their, their need to actually communicate with a customer one-on-one. -on -one. So I understand that, but I'm still going to tell you, you got to talk to your customers. Ash, was that easy for you to do at the beginning? Uh, I forgot to talk about that. That's absolutely that's, that's the hardest part. So, so the very first Lean Startup Machine I did was in New York City. And again, you compare it to Startup Weekend, what a lot of these, the engineers go there and they go, and they're thinking, all right, this is gonna be so cool, we're gonna just, build a product over the weekend, you know, gonna be hanging out with a bunch of buds, you know, this is gonna be great. And, and we took that same team, team of engineers and said, no, get up, go outside, talk to your customers. Mm, you know, this whole table of engineers like shuffling out the door to go talk to, in this one case, it was to talk to tourists and tour guides, because that was what the, the problem they wanted to solve. Mm, they came back, they were so jazzed. They were so jazzed because they actually learned stuff. Uh, LSM in Boston, the boat people, why don't you? Yeah, so uh, one the of the- boat people, that sounds so terrible. It wasn't really, not those kind of boat people. So there's kind of two stories, one. So one is that uh, CustDev can also be a, a very, uh, very great tool to actually uh, validate or invalidate ideas pretty quickly and get a strong signal that'll tell you if it's a scalable startup or, or just maybe a micro business. And, and there's nothing wrong with micro business or lifestyle businesses. You know, Rob obviously is a big advocate for them and, and, and if they're part of who you are, more power to you. One of these uh, teams, they were gonna do Airbnb for, for boats and marinas, right? Is everyone here familiar with Airbnb? Yes, I got like a weird signal there. Raise, <laughs> raise, raise your hand if you've never heard of Airbnb, okay? So Airbnb is a, uh, I believe it's Y Combinator funded startup. Uh, they are absolutely killing it right now and they'll allow you to go to any city and s people can rent out their apartments or rooms uh, to you. So effectively, uh, uh, sort of a hotel, right? So, there, so you go to Seattle or, or Los Angeles, see what hotel rates are and go, oh, I wanna stay actually at a nice little house for two days. And you can do that. It's a great little two-sided marketplace. They're killing it. So you're seeing a lot of, more and more you're seeing a lot of uh, investment pitches that are like, oh, we're going to be the Airbnb for dogs. We're going to be the Airbnb <laughs> for whatever. So these guys were saying, okay, well, we want to you know, play with this, this, this custom methodology. We think actually one of the guys was a boater, was I think, you know, uh, doing this marketplace. Had a, had a lot of do domain expertise in the boating. So his real dream was to go build this, he right. thought he was going to kill it in the market, right? So he does the requisite getting out of the building, talks to uh, marine owners, boat owners, and actually develops an understanding of the economics. Right? It's not an, an, an understanding of what pains they have or what pains they don't have. Turns out, this, there's not a huge need for this sort of marketplace there. Turns out uh, that what really bugs 
marine owners are things that he can't control, so that the general uh, aggregate economic condition and things like weather. Right? Okay, interesting. It turns out there's a boat show that same weekend. So like, all right, go to the boat show, check it out. Walk on the boat show, runs into a, a, a booth, and there's a guy doing effectively the same thing. This guy's been at it for three years and has had a total of like a thousand users. Three years, right? Getting nowhere. Pretty strong signal. Now, that, pretty strong. So that basically, this guy killed, the original guy killed this idea very quickly. He goes, look, this is not working. I know why. I have an understanding of the economics and the potential customers. And I get to see, I get the, the distinct advantage of seeing someone else struggle at it for three years of blood, sweat, and tears, pour their life into it, who doesn't have that understanding, which is kind of sad, right? So, but he was actually able to kill this idea, invalidate this idea very, very quickly. And that's a very powerful, powerful thing to, to have. As if you've ever chased an idea, you know, poured your own passion into it, you know, the, the sooner you know that it actually has some validity and actually can grow into a real business or a scalable startup, the better. So he actually came back, and he was actually jazzed, because he actually had just invalidated in one hour what this other guy that he met was struggling with for three years. So I think we gave that guy old the Old Yeller Award, which oh. is, yeah, go ahead. The Old Yeller Award, you guys may remember the movie from the 50s where they have to take the dog out and shoot it behind the barn because it has rabies. <laughs> and so that's the award we give when you have a cuss dev idea, when you have an idea for a startup, and you actually come to the conclusion it's probably not a great idea, you go, ch -ch -ch. Well, when you're thinking about renaming that to the Osama bin Laden. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, well, one more thing. So these are the meta rules, one, two, and three here. Uh, we didn't really talk about iterate, but I think you guys understand that. There's a, actually also a zeroth rule. Zeroth rule. Anyone familiar with Isaac Asimov and the zeroth law of robotics? There's got to be some nerds in here. Come on. <laughs> so the zeroth rule is there are no rules, right? And and I really sincerely mean that, right? You can have to, once you understand the rules, you can actually have to violate the rules. And this, you see this in, in, in art, you see this in business all the time. One of the reasons that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the fourth movement, is so beautiful because he actually violated the rules of what constructed a symphony at the time when he wrote it, which I believe was 1824. So, and I think Steve would be the first to agree, Steve Blank would be the first to agree, that, again, you have meta rules that you can frame decision-making around, but every situation is different. If you're doing a hardware product that you're selling through some channel, it's going to be radically different than if you're doing, you know, a network effect business like Twitter. All right, so let's talk a little bit about good customer development and so, what we mean by good customer development. So this is a kind of a fun analogy. Uh, I like to fish. I'm not a great fisherman, but I like to fish both rod and reel and, and spear fishing. Um, and I like to think about that good fishermen would probably be good at customer development. If I want to fish for halibut, I know where to find them. Right? I look for sandy bottoms near some structure. Right? If I'm looking for, so that's a halibut on the right side there, and it's a Pacific halibut. They like to go, <laughs> actually, they actually hover above the sand and tuck themselves in, and all you can see is their little eyes. They wait for little fish to swim over, and they actually nabble. The three fish on the other side, those are uh, California white sea bass. Like the most delicious fish ever, if you've ever had it. I actually like halibut fried. How dare you? <laughs> so, uh, California white sea bass are a pelagic fish. They're not benthic, so it means they don't, they, they don't hang out on the bottom. They live in a different place, they have a different ecology, they eat different stuff, and they tend to hang out seeing the, the kelp there. My point is your customers are exactly the same, in terms of how you segment your customers. You need to know where they live, right? So, for example, if you're probably going to like, like the young mom segment, my, my, my wife, we have a nine-month-old little baby. My wife spends an inordinate amount of time on Facebook looking at either uploading pictures of our son or looking at her, our friend's babies, right? So face, I, the way I think about it is Facebook is where she lives, right? However, if you're selling truck parts, those guys probably not so much on Facebook, right? They live in other places on the Internet. And... It's surprising how many startups Brian and I speak to and go, okay, where do, your, where do your customers live? Who are they? Where do they live? It's a very simple question, and it's amazing how many people struggle to actually um, answer that question. So I, I like to think about how fishermen think about fish. It should be how you think about customers in segments. And it's not, it's not even like they can't even just, they, it's not just that they don't answer where do they live. It's like, oh, I don't even care where they live. I'm just going to do AdWords. Really? 
we believe in uh, so, uh, searching for a solution to the problem that you think that they're having. So segmentation, I'm all about documenting your business model. But just so you know, your segments properly done will drive the rest of your business model. So here's a great customer development example, uh, good and bad. So the, uh, this is actually great because it kind of segues a lot about what, what Ash talked about, about uh, how do you know what, what your customers are telling you is true. Both these companies um, uh, reached out to their customers to figure out you know, what can we, how can we drive innovation or set customer satisfaction from actual customer feedback. Right, so so Walmart, for example, sent a survey to them, said, "Hey, uh, uh, do you think that our aisles should be more cluttered?" Um, Southwest does something similar, and they got interesting responses back. So Walmart got this response like, "Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Walmart Walmart's aisles should be less cluttered. That would be awesome." Right, great. Southwest, they get a lot of things like, "Oh, we want interline bag transfer, we want food service, and we want reserved seating." So here's where it gets actually interesting. Southwest Airlines effectively told their customers to fuck off. Didn't say it explicitly like I just did to get a reaction out of you, but they actually ignored what their customers said they wanted. 